So, if you can take your seat, we can start with the second lecture by Hiroshi. Okay, uh, thank you for coming to my second lecture. So, uh, yesterday uh, we finished the discussion of primer of information theory. So, today uh, I would like to uh, review aspect of ADHCFT correspondence that's uh, relevant uh, for the rest of my lecture and hope to get into the beginning of a discussion of holographic uh, entanglement entropy. I guess this is how we got it. Is this better? Okay. So, uh, so ADS-CFT correspondence. So this is a correspondence between a gravity theory, quantum gravity theory, uh, in d plus one dimensional uh, antideta space times possibly some compact space. And uh, this space, uh, you can, for example, uh, introduce some metric. where uh, x is uh, Minkowskian coordinate, which goes from zero, which is time, to d minus one. So this has a standard Lorentzian signature metric, which is minus dx naught square, plus i goes from one to d minus one of dx i square. And uh, these uh, extra coordinate that basically measure the distance to the boundary uh, of this space. Uh, I'm going to set this, what you may call uh, the curvature radius of ADS to be equal to one. So I'm going to remove this, okay? And uh, uh, so this is supposed to be equivalent as a quantum theory to d-dimensional conformal field theory. And it's important to stress that uh, this is actually isomorphism of uh, Hilbert spaces. Uh, and operator algebras on, on, it, on them. So in CFT side, well, it's a standard quantum field theory, so you can define Hilbert space and define operator algebra. In ADS side, we don't have by itself a uh, non-perturbative definition of the theory, but you can perturbatively quantize it, and uh, the perturbative part should match up with this. You don't have a non-perturbative definition on, the, on this side, but you can use this. If you assume this isomorphism, then you can use this as a definition on this side. Okay, and then you can, uh, you can discuss various consistency check of this proposal, which I'm not going to do. Uh, conformal field theory, uh, as the name suggests, has a conformal invariance. And in particular, this conformal field theory, so this has a conformal invariance, which in particular contains scale invariance. So what it means is that, uh, oh, by the way, so under this correspondence, we are to identify this coordinate on the boundary at z equals zero. Uh, to the coordinate of this conformal field theory. So I'm going to use the same x. So, uh, and then suppose I analytically continue this uh, time coordinate so that it, we are now in Euclidean uh, signature uh, d-dimensional space. And then conformal transformation is a rescaling of these coordinates by some factor. So this is a conformal scaling transformation. And in this conformal field theory, there are lots of uh, operators. And these, these local operators, uh, each of them, are characterized by the scaling dimension. So delta is called scaling dimension. Okay, 
And one of the very important concepts in conformal field theory, and which plays a very key role in this correspondence, is the so-called state operator correspondence. of conformal field theory. So there are two correspondences, so I should not con get confused. This is a con con correspondence within conformal field theory, not correspondence to this side. The con with a correspondence between, uh, con uh, within conformal field theory, and it is a correspondence between local operators having this fixed scaling property to states in conformal field theory. More specifically, if you have a local operator, O of X uh, with scaling dimension delta, then it's supposed to be equivalent to a state. So I denote the state, uh, just to remember which state we are considering, use the same symbol as the operator, uh, in the Hilbert space of a conformal field theory. But then, this conformal field theory Hilbert space uh, is defined on the cylinder. Uh, conform, we are placing conformal field theory on the cylinder. So you have uh, d-dimensional space-time where the conformal field theory is defined. You have a time direction here. And then you have uh, d minus one dimensional sphere. So space-like section of this conformal field theory is d-dimensional, uh, d minus one-dimensional sphere, and then you can propagate this in the time direction. Okay, and the way that the correspondence works is the following. So if you have a local operator here, if you have local operator, you can place it, say, at the origin of uh, this coordinate. It can be anywhere, but because it's translational invariant. But suppose you place it on the origin in this original Euclidean a Poincaré coordinate, flat Poincaré coordinate, then there is a scaling invariance. The scaling invariance generate the scaling away from this origin. Right, so this is a scaling. And then delta is an eigen, eigenvalue under scaling operation if you place the operator over here. But under, so the, since the theory is invariant under conformal transformation, we can perform conformal transformation. And in particular, there is a conformal transformation which maps W into Z like that. And if you perform this conformal transformation, if Z is this plane, or if W is a coordinate on this plane, then Z is going to be coordinate on the cylinder. Here I'm actually uh, uh, doing this uh, in the case of D core two, but uh, you can do it in any dimension. So you can, you can see that uh, Z coordinate is actually coordinate on the cylinder because uh, the, this, is, this, thing, this coordinate is invariant, this relation is invariant under shift of Z by two pi i. So this Z coordinate is a co natural coordinate on the cylinder and uh, uh, this scaling, the scaling transformation now becomes a translation in this direction. So, so if you insert this operator here, now you have a state here, which propagate in this direction, and eigen, eigenvalue of the, under this propagation is exactly delta. So this is basically the reason for this relation between the local operator with conformal dimension or scaling dimension delta to state, normalized, normalizable state of conformal field theory Hilbert space on the cylinder. So this is a relation between flat Minkowski space oper local operator and state on this cylinder. Okay, so this is a very important concept and very useful in many occasions that it's very important to understand this. Okay, is this clear? Okay, so now this Hilbert space of CFT on this cylinder, uh, on this, on this Hilbert space, we have a representation of a conformal symmetry, where the theory has conformal invariance. So state in this uh, Hilbert space of conformal field theory should be decomposable into 
sum of, pro, sum of represent, unitary representation of this conformal symmetry. Namely, this must, we should be able to decompose it into rep representations of uh, conformal algebras. Conformal algebra. And uh, so under this correspondence, what happens is that if you have a primary field, Namely, that uh, you can decompose this, uh, uh, you can, you can decom uh, classify this operator under representation of conformal transformation, and you have a highest weight state, which we, make, we call primary state. So primary field correspond to the highest weight state uh, on this uh, uh, a space like uh, uh, sphere. Okay, so this is the correspondence between operator in conformal field theory and state in conf uh, uh, conformal field theory, and in particular, highest weight state and the conformal, conformal symmetry correspond to what is called the primary field. In uh, a, sh a CFT side, this, you can think of this as a definition of primary field, if you like. Yes, please. Okay, I'm coming to that. Actually, I'm going to discuss non-local no, no, non, non operator or non-normalizable operator? No, no. Oh, non-local operators like uh, Wilson line yeah. operators. Yes. Uh, so those have different, is, are invariant under different subspace of conformal transform. These preserves different conformal transformations. So, for example, this one, preserves conformal transformation which fix this point, for example, right? And then, then this is, this, therefore it's an eigenstate of, uh, of the scaling transformation. If you have, for example, extended uh, Wilson line operator like extended things, then it will be invariant under scaling in, along this direction or transverse direction, but not rotation, for example. So it will preserve different symmetry, okay? So these will not correspond to state. These would correspond to something else. And it's like the domain wall or some other operators. So I'm not going to talk about extended operator in this talk, in this lecture. So, so I would rather not get into that. I'd be happy to discuss with you about this subject later, if you like. OK? Can you say a little bit about the definition of the Uh Yeah, I could do it, but maybe in discussion session. Because I don't think uh, my, the, the, the purpose of this lecture is not about conformal ADA shift. This, I'm just reviewing the relevant part of this. So, so but just briefly, so, so conformal algebra include translation and the Poincare, uh, 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 Lorentz transformation, namely the standard Poincare symmetry of this uh, uh, Minkowski space, plus scaling transformation, plus you have this thing called the special conformal transformation. And, uh, uh, there is actually a deep question of uh, whether if you assume Poincare symmetry, unitarity, and scale invariance, it can be upgraded to conformal invariance or not. Last year at this same school, Zohar Komargoski, I think, gave some set of lecture on this subject. And uh, uh, yeah, so, uh, so that's basically the uh, conformal symmetry in general dimension, in two dimension, this can be further enhanced to Virasoro symmetry. I don't think I have time to discuss more, uh, disc describe more, more than that. Now, I'd be happy to discuss with you personally or at the discussion session, okay? Yeah, so you can, you, the, uh, you, the rep unitary representation of these algebras are completely classified and known. And those are the things that appear over here. Okay, now, so here, uh, so this, this coordinate that I introduced here is uh, called the uh, Poincare coordinate. And, uh, but in order to dis dis discuss this type of state operator correspondence, more useful coordinate is uh, global coordinate. Uh, which is, uh, given by, so I'm setting the uh, ADS scale to be one. 
So this is a time direction. T is a time. Rho is again measuring the distance to the boundary of ADS. So you have D rho square plus sine hyperbolic square rho D omega D minus 1 square. And this is actually the metric on unit D minus 1 dimensional sphere. That's why I wrote omega D minus 1 square. Okay? So, so pictorically, uh, what it looks like is again cylinder, but including the interior. So, so this, is, this conformal field theory is defined on the cylinder, the surface of the cylinder, but uh, the ADS space includes this uh, uh, interior of this. So it's sort of a solid body. Okay, so it's a solid cylinder, if you like. And uh, this is a, so this is a, so time direction goes in this direction. So these shaded regions are space-like section of this uh, global ADS co uh, uh, coordinate. And this space-like section look like Poincare disk, uh, it's a hyperbolic space in D minus one, sorry, D dimension, excuse me, D dimension. The total space is D plus one dimension. So this, this is hyperbolic space. Euclidean signature hyperbolic space, and basically, so this metric here is metric of the hyperbolic space where uh, rho is infinity at the boundary. So the distance to the boundary is infinite, okay? And the time goes in this way, and uh, of course, the uh, omega parameterizes the sphere D minus one dimensional sphere on the boundary. Now this coordinate we have right here only covers part of this space, which is, uh, sort of, uh, you, can, you, can you can consider some kind of uh, a square tilted uh, in 45 degrees and uh, patched over here. So on the boundary, and then, so this boundary region uh, correspond to z equal zero in this coordinate. So at z equal zero, we have uh, this square region. So this is z equal zero in Poincaré coordinate. Where a constant x naught slice goes like this. So this corresponds to x naught equal constant. And then a constant space uh, point goes in this way. So suppose, for example, you have fixed point in x1 to xd minus 1. And they go into time direction along x0, you will be traveling along this direction. So this is a Poincare coordinate squashed uh, into this square region. Okay? So you can imagine you have a cylinder. And then on the boundary of the cylinder, you paste this in this way. So that's the region which is covered by the, uh, and of course you have interior of this space. In the global coordinate, the entire hyperbolic disk is covered by this coordinate. Whereas uh, in this Poincare coordinate, basically the region covered is inside of this, this area. Uh, I can describe this more precisely, but this is roughly the idea. Any question? That's clear? So Poincare coordinate covers only some part of this uh, uh, entire ADS space, but uh, in this uh, overlapping region, we can use both coordinates. But if you want to describe, so for example, the, uh, when you talk about uh, state operator correspondence, the time that we are talking about for conformal field theory, 
This time is to be identified with this T. Okay? So that's why I'm introducing these two sets of coordinates. Is that clear? So now, uh, so I told you that uh, there is a state in conformal field theory. There are state in conformal field theory. There are operator in the conformal field theory. Those are concepts on this side. And then we need to identify the corresponding concept on this side. And we can identify at least a subclass of the, you have a, you have a question. Pick up. I cannot hear you, the microphone is not on. You can speak loud. Global, yes, sorry? No, no, in Poincare coordinates is same? So, so, yeah, these are just coordinate transformation. So we are talking about the same space-time, anti-eta space-time, it's the same Lorentzian signature manifold. I'm just talking about the two different coordinates on this manifold. And the, these two different manifolds covers different part of this anti-eta space. The global coordinate, as the name suggests, covers the entire anti-eta space, fully extended anti-eta space, whereas Poincaré coordinate only covers part of it. Is that clear? Yes, yes. Thank you. So I just, I was trying to describe exactly where each of these coordinates covers, okay? Poincaré coordinate does not cover the boundary. Poincaré coordinate do cover the boundary. This is the boundary. Of, and that's pasted over here. So imagine, so, so Poincaré coordinate covers, so this is the CFT side. Z equals zero in the Poincaré coordinate covers this part of the cylinder. Okay? And uh, you can work out, for example, explicit coordinate transformation. For example, in 99, I wrote this review article with four authors. And uh, so in, if you look it up, that uh, it's a uh, 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 physics report review article. Uh, there is a, I have, we have shown explicit coordinate transformation between this Poincaré coordinate and the global coordinate. You have a question? Yeah, we'll, we'll use that. So, so you don't have to worry about the example because I'm going to use these uh, in the rest of the uh, lectures. Okay, any more question? Okay, well, I, maybe I should have spent a little bit more time uh, uh, reviewing it. I wasn't sure about the level of students, so, uh, but uh, if you want to sp me to talk more, expand more on this, I'd be happy to do that, but uh, if you rather well, want me to go on to some more advanced subject, I'd be happy to do that as well. Okay, uh, maybe uh, we can continue on, and if you have questions, you can come see me or discuss further on the discussion session. Okay. Now, so let's discuss ADS side further. So suppose you have some uh, 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 field in the bulk of ADS, and it can be scalar field, gauge field, spinner, graviton, etc. For simplicity, let me just talk about scalar fields. So in the case of scalar field, suppose it satisfies the Klein-Gordon equation, and uh, I discussed that in, first of all, the, in the global coordinate. And the first thing that you may ask is uh, how you can consider normalizable solution to this. Normalizable solutions are the one that decays sufficiently. Not, it's important to note that the uh, anterior space is non-compact space. So you have to consider normalizable state in order for the state to be corresponding to actually the solution, uh, wave solution, to correspond to state in uh, anti-data space. And one of the criteria is whether you can make the action finite. Suppose you find a solution, you substitute that solution into the action and evaluate the action, is that finite or does it diverge? Okay, so that would be a criteria for normalizability. Okay, so since the geometry has time translational invariance, so it's useful to consider a solution whose time dependence is stationary like that. 
And if you substitute, and then, then the, the rest of the thing depends on, uh, uh, sorry, uh, 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 these coordinate with omega dependence here. So you can substitute this into that and then solve it. And basically, you can solve that exactly using hypergeometric functions. I'm not going to go into detail. The answer is that omega is actually delta plus n, where n is a non-negative integer. And n just corresponds to descendants of conformal algebra. So primary field has omega equal delta. And then you act conformal gener algebra generators. And then that's going to generate omega which differ from the ground state one by some positive integer amount, OK? And then what is delta? Well, if you substitute this into that, you, what you find is a relation between the mass and the delta. And the relation is that uh, basically the, 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 this box, if you add, act on this, turns into uh, minus delta minus d over 2 square plus d over 2 square. And then, then you have to add m square to it. And then you have to add m square to it. And then it has to vanish by the klein gordon equation. So this is a klein gordon equation in this basis. And uh, well, this is a quadratic equation, so you can solve it. And, uh, and then there are two solutions, because it's a quadratic equation. So you have two solutions, delta plus minus which is equal to minus of d over 2 square plus, uh, oh, what am I writing? I'm sorry. d over 2 plus or minus square root of uh, d over 2 square plus m square. OK? So uh, just as if we, we go back to uh, junior high school, let me draw some picture. So this is delta. This is m squared. m squared is given by quadratic expression in delta. And uh, so it looks like this. Okay, so this is a relation between m squared and delta, where the minimum, can you, can you read this here? Minimum is located where delta is d over 2. Okay. And then let me, for the later purpose, also draw two more places. So let me draw this in red, just to distinguish this. And then you have uh, d over 2 plus 1 and d over 2 minus 1. OK. So, so there is a relation between mass square and delta. You can see that if I choose plus branch of this solution, it covers this side. Because, uh, well, if you choose plus branch, then this will be an increasing function of mass squared. If your mass squared is increased, the delta increases. The minimum value is d over 2. Because when m squared, so the, this is where the m squared is equal to minus d over 2 squared. Right. So when m square is minus d over 2 square, this vanishes, and this is d over 2. That will be the minimum value of the plus branch. And then it increases like that. If I choose minus branch, it would increase as mass square decreases. Right? So it goes this. So you have two branches. OK? Now, so one interesting feature is that mass square negative is allowed. Mass square negative is allowed. And uh, so in Minkowski space, mass square has to be positive. But in ADS, mass square has to be, can be negative as far as it is greater than or equal to minus d over 2 square. So mass square has to be greater than this. And this is known as a bright and lower Friedman bound. OK, so that's one observation. Another important observation is that if you look at this, and if you think that uh, you should choose delta plus as a correspondence between this highest weight delta, the conformal dimension, and the mass, there is a puzzle. Because uh, in conformal field theory, uh, in D dimension, there is so-called so unitarity bound of conformal dimension. 
that there is actually, a, if you require unitarity of a representation of a conformal algebra, there is a smallest value of delta you can have, and delta has to be greater than that. And often, in many conformal field theory, you have operator at or close to this minimum value. So you, those should be allowed. But those minimum value, the unitarity bound, is not d over 2, but actually d over 2 minus 1, the reflection of this. So in fact, therefore, this region should be allowed. So the, in order for the ADS-CFT correspondence to work so that you have an operator, you have a, you have a, a, a state, uh, you, have a, a, a field, field, you have a field corresponding to state, this, this range should be allowed up to here. So that means that for this range, you have to choose delta minus branch. Anyway, so that's sort of a relation between normalizable state and uh, the corresponding uh, uh, state in conformal field theory. So you asked me to use Poincaré coordinate, so I'm now going to use that. So, so this is a description of a correspondence between a field, in this case, a scalar field, massive scalar field in Einstein space, and operator with conformal dimension delta. So this is a relation between mass in ADS and conformal dimension in CFT. Okay? Uh, so how do I do this in Poincaré coordinate? So if you use the Poincaré coordinate, Oh, uh, I forgot to say one more important thing before I go to Poincaré coordinates. So let me do that over here. So I told you that uh, we, we, we are considering this solution the klein gordon equation, and we are considering solution where phi goes like e to the minus i omega t plus some uh, uh, factorized form with uh, rho and omega over here. Okay? And uh, we found that omega goes to delta plus possibly some integers. So let's just consider the highest weight state where omega is delta. If you analytically continue, if you go do the weak rotation, so that the time becomes uh, the Euclidean time tau, then this dependence will give you e to the minus omega tau. Right? So, uh, so that's, so what, that, what, so, so what does it mean? So that means that uh, uh, if you consider cylinder and now in Euclidean time, and then this omega is now delta, so it goes like that. In the Euclidean time tau, and if you have a cylinder like that, then its dependence is like that. Now, if you conform or transform the ba that back to Poincaré coordinate, where you have a boundary point, and then you have a scaling transformation like that, uh, remember that uh, there is a relation between this scaling direction and tau direction this radial coordinate r is equal to e to the uh, 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 tau. So that tau goes to minus infinity correspond to this point. Tau goes to infinity scales away uh, this. So, so that means that uh, uh, you can map this type of transformation property to the scaling by r to the delta. OK? So this leads to the following observation that if you actually describe this type of solution in Poincaré coordinate, where you have a metric given by this, then again, you can solve the Klein-Gordon equation. This is a solution to Klein-Gordon equation 
uh, in the global coordinate, and uh, this gives you stationary solution like that, and I told you which one's normalizable and which one's not normalizable. And we can repeat the same exercise here. If I use this coordinate, then near the boundary where z goes to zero, you have two solutions, because it's a second order differential equation, so typically you have two solutions. And one goes like that, and the other goes like that. Where a and b are some function of x, and then z dictate how this scales as z goes to zero. Okay, so if you compare this behavior where you have z to the delta power here to the behavior here where if you have a normalizable state with a conformal dimension delta, then it would scale like rescaling by delta, you would see that this should correspond to normalizable state. So you have two solutions to, for uh, two solutions to this klein golden equation because it's a second order equation. One is normalizable and another is not normalizable. This corresponds to non-normalizable solution. And then this, uh, this one corresponds to normalizable solutions. Uh, you see that there is actually a, a map between delta to d minus delta. And this is exactly the map that exchanges delta plus and delta minus. So, so if uh, uh, delta is delta plus, then d minus delta is equal to delta minus, and vice versa. So, so that means that uh, uh, if the delta is in this range, the delta plus is correspond to normalizable mode, and delta minus correspond to non-normalizable mode. If you are in this range between bright Euler friedman bound and the unitarity bound of conformal field theory, then it's the other way around. The delta minus is a normalizable mode, and the delta plus is non-normalizable mode. This range is a bit funny, because it turns out that if you uh, just use the normalizability of the action as a condition for normalizability, then both of these are normalizable. So you have to make a choice. And the choice is made by the requirement that it matches up with the conformal transformation property. Okay? So this is a normalizable state, normalizable solution. So that this must correspond to a state in conformal field theory. So that means that uh, uh, if you have a B of X, then you must have corresponding operator. And then B of X should be given by expectation value of that operator for the corresponding state. On the other hand, this does not correspond to state because this would not be normalizable. State should be normalizable. So this, is, this does not correspond to state in conformal field theory, but rather, this would correspond to the perturbation generated by source. So namely, you have a Lagrangian of conformal field theory, the original conformal field theory. You can consider perturbing this conformal field theory by adding some source with the corresponding operator and integrate it over the conformal field theory space. So this A corresponds to the source. And this scaling behavior and this property matches up consistently because here you, you look, uh, O has a conformal dimension delta. So if you rescale the coordinate, this would rescale like uh, lambda to the delta. So if you rescale X by lambda delta X, this operator would rescale like that. On the other hand, if you do the rescaling, same rescaling for this coordinate, in order for the metric to stay invariant, z, sorry, I'm sorry. If, the, if x is rescaled like that, so I should, I should uh, do it more carefully. So if x is rescaled like that, then o is rescaled by this conformal dimension. 
Okay? But in the ADS side, in order for this metric to stay fixed, if x is rescaled by lambda, z has to be rescaled by the same lambda. So that means that b is rescaled in the same way. This would induce the rescaling of b by this. So you see that both hand sides scales in the same way, so that's consistent. If you go, go, go to here, you can also see that there is a similar consistency, because now O is scale like delta of, uh, lambda of delta. But since we are talking about conformal field theory, whole thing should be scale invariant. So this should transform in such a way that that would compensate for the scaling behavior. But we should remember that coordinate also scales. So that would give you a pro a additional power of lambda to the d, because there are d coordinates. Is it d minus 1? Oh, yeah, yeah, d, actually, I'm sorry. You have d-dimensional conformal field theory. So you, this would scale like lambda to the minus, minus d, because it's coordinate, so it scales in the opposite way. So then, uh, in order to cancel that, you, you need to have this type of behavior. Okay? So, 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 that, so, it matches, so this scaling behavior matches up with the fact that B corresponds to expectation value of the operator, whereas A corresponds to source that is, uh, you are introducing in order to turn on this type of perturbation to the conformal field theory side. Okay? So I have until uh, 10... Oh, oh, five or well, something like that, since I started at uh, five minutes uh, yeah, late. Yeah. I have uh, like 20 minutes left. Okay, so I have to skip some discussion, but then, uh, so this relation suggests, this relation suggests that if you have a, a operator in so su suppose you consider the following thing. So suppose you, have, you are in ADS and D plus one dimensional space. So that means that uh, in global coordinate, you have this kind of geometry. And then you have a uh, uh, solid cylinder, if you like. So this is a, a ADS space. And then suppose you have this uh, Klein-Gordon scalar field in ADS, okay, so among other fields. And uh, suppose you perturbatively quantize system, gravitational system, including this scalar field. To the leading order in perturbation, you treat all the field as free field, and you quantize them, and you construct Fox space. And then there will be a, a, a Heisenberg operator corresponding to the scalar field phi. And that Heisenberg operator uh, is a function of t rho omega, and it acts on the Fox space of this field phi, right? So, so you have a Fox space, which is a Hilbert space, uh, part of the Hilbert space of this bulk gravitational system. And then there must be an operator uh, uh, phi hat, which creates this uh, particle corresponding to this field anywhere inside the one Twitter space. So let's say here. So, so you can insert this operator, add this operator, multiply this operator to the vacuum state of uh, ADS gravity, and that would create a particle at this location of uh, T uh, rho and omega. Right? So here we have time T, for example. Okay, so you have such operator. And then if you compute expectation value of that, it should give you expectation value of uh, 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 this uh, corresponding operator O. Now, I have said that one of the fundamental statement of ADS CFT correspondence is that Hilbert space of conformal field theory quantized on the cylinder, which is a boundary of this geometry, should, it should be isomorphic to the Hilbert space 
of gravitational theory in the bulk. So in the limit where you can do the perturbative quantization of gravitational theory, where you have Fox space, etc., then the Fox space stage should correspond to state in conformal field theory, and indeed they correspond. Because if you co create a one particle state, that would correspond to primary field, primary state of conformal field theory of conformal dimension delta. Now, if you have a state uh, correspondence between the state, you also have to have correspondence between operators. So that means that, well, since you have uh, this operator which creates a particle at this location in Anchorita space, there must be a corresponding operator in conformal field theory. And that operator must have this consistency condition. So that suggests, and uh, this led to many people starting from late 90s, uh, to think about the relation between this local operator and uh, uh, the, uh, 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 in, the, in the bulk. And uh, and the conformal field theory part. And uh, this is, I should say, uh, is to the leading order, as I said, uh, in the perturbation, perturbative consideration of uh, gravitational theory in the bulk of ADS space. And uh, there are, in general, corrections due to interactions in ADS. And other consideration, for example, here I'm talking about a, uh, a scalar field. But if you have a gauge field or a gravitational field, you have to also make appropriate connection to maintain the gauge invariance and diffeomorphism invariance, which I'm not discussing right now. But you, have, uh, you must have some kind of linear relation between operator in the bulk and operator uh, in the conformal field theory. And there must be, there must be also similar correspondence between, uh, between them in Poincaré coordinate, which I'm going to discuss. So let me discuss this in the context of Poincaré coordinate. So then I can write this. Sorry. Yes? And of course, there are gravitons which are also quantized, which correspond to some uh, Gaussian fluctuation of the geometry. Yeah, so we can similarly quantize gravitons, and then there are corresponding operators which are related to the energy momentum tensor on the boundary. The, I'm not doing the gravitational part because it involves some additional subtlety because of the gauge invariance and diffeomorphism invariance. It's easier to discuss in the case. But uh, there are literature, especially people like uh, uh, Kabat, Lifshitz, Lau, who have studied extensively about the subtlety coming from this type of gauge invariance. So, uh, so we are uh, interested in understanding how uh, uh, this relation works out. So there must be a re re linear relation between the uh, uh, local operator on the boundary and the local operator corresponding to creation of particle in the bulk up to interactions. And uh, this function G is called the smearing function. And in order for this to be consistent with this property, it has to satisfy the condition that uh, since we want O hat, a uh, phi hat of z of x as z goes to zero goes to this local operator in the conformal field theory. 
So that means that correspondingly, this smearing function has to have the property like that as z goes to zero. And this should also satisfy the klein golden equation in the bulk with respect to undotted coordinate. <coughs> And you can find a, a solution to, to such a set of conditions. And I should note that in the, if you look at the ADS-CFT correspondence literature, then there is a notion of bulk boundary propagator. This is not the bulk boundary propagator. That, that satisfies a different boundary condition. Uh, but you can actually find, in, in certain cases, uh, you can actually find explicit form. Uh, Sometimes it's not a smooth function, as you can see, where it involves delta function. So you have to actually uh, extend the notion of function to include the generalized function to define uh, the smearing function properly. But that's fine because it's actually integrated over with this local operator. So for example, even if this contains delta function, this integral makes sense. Okay, so I was uh, going to discuss uh, a little bit about how to construct such smearing function, but uh, uh, I, uh, I don't think I have time for that, so I'm just going to mention one reference. So there is a paper by Hamilton about uh, uh, lift sheet. Uh, 0606. One for one. Uh, oh, I forgot. Is uh, Lao in, in this literature? Do you remember? Yes. Excuse me. So uh, for this reason, uh, uh, in, in particular, the construction of G uh, along this literature is called HKLL. And uh, so I, so this is well. Actually, there is a long series of references, and uh, this is one of them. But uh, this is actually a particular one that I'm going to use. And uh, uh, so in particular, uh, we can, so what they, that they showed is that uh, you can actually choose a G in such a way that it has support on only part of the boundary. So here, uh, I'm assuming that I'm integrating over the entire range of the boundary. But uh, actually, it turns out that in order to construct a local operator in particular part of the bulk, you don't have to integrate over the entire boundary part. You just have to integrate some subpart of the boundary. Okay? So let me uh, spend the uh, uh, remaining 10 minutes in specifying which part of the boundary that uh, this particular smearing function requires to integrate. And this actually leads to some kind of paradox, which uh, is a sort of uh, one of the main, uh, going to be a main theme of this lecture. But uh, uh, let me make a preparation for this. So, so actually, uh, today it looks like I'm actually running a little bit slower than, uh, I'm not covering less than I had prepared to talk about because I realized that I had to tell you a little bit more about uh, ADHD correspondence, but that's fine. So, uh, so let me, in order to specify where to integrate, so what, here is what I want to do. Okay, so I have this uh, antidata space. And uh, uh, so what I'm going to do is that uh, I'm going to tell you that suppose you, have, you want to construct bulk local operator at some particular point in the bulk. I'm going to show you that it's sufficient to integrate this equation. Oh, because uh, you know that uh, if you have uh, a free field theory, in, so you, you probably learned in, uh, uh, in your, did you take course in quantum field theory, right? So, so in the first thing you learned is how to, quanti how to quantize free field. 
and the, to the, the quantized free field, the Heisenberg field for the quantized free field satisfies the equation of motion. You solve this equation, and then you, 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 you find some partial wave solution. Each of that has a creation and annihilation operator on it. Right? So that's this phi hat. That's why this satisfies this equation. Because I'm just doing the perturbative quantization of the local field in the bulk. The first thing to do is to quantize free field, which is the procedure is to start with solving linearized free field equation, and then uh, 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 the, take the coefficient to be creation and uh, annihilation operator. Right? That's what I'm doing here. And I'm saying that that should be expressible as a linear combination of local operator in the conformal field theory. Okay? So, so this is interesting because uh, this means that uh, you can actually reconstruct local operator in the bulk in terms of local oper linear combination superposition of local operator in the boundary CFT. So I, I just wanted to decode this dictionary a little bit more, uh, more detail. Okay? Now, so, 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 so this operator phi hat is located here. And I want to construct this local operator as a linear superposition of uh, this boundary operator. In principle, you, I, I told you a priori reason why you can construct it as an integral over entire boundary. Now I'm going to tell you that you can actually, you don't have to do that. You can only consider some subspace of the boundary. So let me specify which subspace we will be talking about. So, so, so this, correspond, this boundary is z equals 0. So let's open up this z equals 0. So you have, a, you, have a, you have a z equals 0 over here. So this is just a boundary of ADS. And uh, this is time direction. And then this is space of CFT. Suppose you consider, you consider some subspace of this space-like direction. OK? Is this clear? So you consider this so subspace here. We are considering this subspace A here. And uh, now I'm going to define what is called the domain of dependence of A. So domain of dependence of A is defined as follows. So suppose you pick any point in the domain of dependence and then take any curve that is time-like. Then it has to pass through A either in its future or in its past. So collection of such point, the set of points which have this property is called domain of dependence. So it's typically of this kind of uh, 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 a square region. And uh, these lines are light-like. Because, for example, if you pick a point here, you can actually go extend the time-like curve indefinitely without crossing A, right? So this point is outside of the domain of dependence. This point is inside of the domain of dependence. So this is D of A. So this is the boundary so this is, this is D of A. This is my definition of D of A. OK? So now, we have this region. So we have this antiliter space. So now I'm going to tell you that if you have this, so now I have this domain of dependence on the boundary. So I have this domain of dependence. And then I'm going to tell you that how much, which part of Antelita space that I can reconstruct by doing integral like that. So what you can show, and what was shown in explicit uh, example by uh, Kabat, uh, uh, Hamilton, Kabat, Lipschitz, and Lau, is that uh, the part of Antelita space that you can reconstruct is called the causal wedge.
Okay, so in the remaining two minutes, I have to draw a picture of causal wedge. So what I'm going to do is the following. So uh, let's reduce everything in one dimension to by one dimension, so that uh, uh, the boundary z equals zero is now line. So so far, the boundary is drawn just like two-dimensional cylinder. It's actually d minus one-dimensional circle sphere times the time. But let's just shrink everything to along this line. So then the domain of dependence, so, the, so, so A is sort of now presented as a point. And then domain of dependence is somewhere between here and here. So you have a domain of dependence here. OK? I hope you, you follow me. So, so I'm just considering this domain of dependence, but now represented it as one dimensional line segment. The uh, causal wedge is defined as intersection of future and the past of uh, this domain of dependence in the bulk of ADS d plus one. So here you have CFT d. So you consider all possible future of this domain of dependence. These are the future of the domain of dependence. And then you have a past of the domain of dependence. There is an intersection of this. What it means is that if you pick any point inside of this causal wedge, you can draw future pointing time-like curve and you can reach D of A. You can draw past pointing curve and you can reach the boundary. So that's your uh, causal wedge. So uh, the statement is that uh, this construction works provided that uh, uh, Z and X, so provided that integral is restricted over D of A and Z of X belongs to the causal wedge of A. So previously, the integral was supposed to be all entire uh, boundary of ADS, the entire space that CFT is defined. But uh, it turns out that you can actually restrict this integral to the causal wedge, so the uh, domain, uh, domain of dependence of A, and you know that you provided that the point you are interested in reside in causal wedge of the same region A. So this is a very uh, interesting statement that you can reconstruct operator in the bulk by using only part of the operator algebra of the acting on the Hilbert space, not the entire uh, uh, space. Now this leads to some paradox that I don't have time to discuss today. Uh, which and then resolution to the paradox re reveals that uh, the state in this uh, conformal field theory dual to the bulk gravitational theory where we can describe, which we can describe in terms of this perturbative consideration has particular entanglement property. That's where actually the notion of entanglement comes in. The title of my, that this set of lecture is entanglement and geometry. And this fact that uh, uh, you can reconstruct this operator by just using part of the Hilbert space, the subspace associated to this region A, leads to a paradox whose resolution uncovers very non-trivial, interesting, and deep entanglement for state describing this kind of gravitational system. And we can exploit that to learn various things about the uh, quantum gravity theory in Einstein space. So that will, be, that will be the subject uh, in the next two lectures. Okay, thank you very much. Maybe there is time for one question because we are...